I'm Steve Spear. I'm a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management, author of The High Velocity Edge and some other work under development right now with Gene Kim of IT Revolution. And I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to, you've given me to share some thoughts with you about how firms and other enterprises more generally compete and compete successfully. So the background on this is that for the last 20, 30 years, I've been interested in how some firms in very level playing field situations are able to generate so much more value than their competitors. And what seems to come out over and over and over again is that uh, when you get past uh, common access to technology, common access to markets and customers, common access maybe even of understanding of what markets and customers want and will reward, the uh, principal difference is that the uh, those who lead are better able to figure out what the market wants and better figure out how to generate and develop uh, solutions to the market's problems better than anybody else. And so certainly the um, idea of thinking about how organizations compete through the generation and application of new and useful knowledge, that certainly seems relevant in the period we're in. And so as I get into the presentation, I want to cover a couple of points with you all. Um, first is uh, motivation. Why do we even think about this issue of competing through the speed uh, with which we can generate new and useful uh, and applicable knowledge? Why is that so important in this period of abrupt change? Um, combination of changing economic environment and changing technology and all of that. And then after we talk about the motivation for being concerned about such things, we'll get into a discussion about um, some tactics, some strategies that organizations can use to compete on the basis of uh, generating new and useful and applicable knowledge. So first speaking about the, uh, the motivations, why are we worried right now, 2021, about um, how we manage our enterprises in the face of abrupt changes. Now, certainly um, we are well aware of the uh, sort of abrupt nonlinear changes we're going through. So on the strategic side, the competitive side, there's all this change in the, uh, the competitive landscape. Um, what had uh, previously been a dominance by, you know, US, Japan, Germany as a representative of the uh, European U Union, uh, China has established itself as the world's second largest economy and um, technologically sophisticated with uh, territorial economic political aspirations, which um, really are uncharacteristic, let's say, of uh, Japan in the 1980s or Germany coming out of the post-war period. And all that has happened. All right, so that's already shaking up uh, what the competitive landscape looks like. And that's all occurring in a period when we have all this uh, phenomenal uh, technological change. Um, we've got all the digital stuff of machine learning, artificial intelligence, ro uh, telemetry, robotics, automation. Um, we've got the uh, the biotechnology stuff going on. Really sort of um, nonlinear, abrupt, discontinuous change in how we um, are experiencing and developing and applying technology. And what we've seen is that um, some firms have done phenomenally well navigating through this period. Uh, and some firms have really stumbled, again, on level playing field kind of situations. And um, when you start thinking about these comparisons, it could be Google versus Yahoo, Amazon versus Barnes and Noble. Um, in terms of the opportunities, kind of level playing field. In terms of the resources that were available, again, uh, equal access to the, uh, the available resources. And really what uh, is left in terms of um, explaining the differences in outcome, it really has to be a difference in the learning curve that the, those who have succeeded and continue to succeed have done so because they've been able to generate very, very, very steep learning curves in terms of mastering the new operating environment and mastering the new technology. And of course, developing some of that new technology where the others who've lagged somehow, they've been able to master the new environment uh, slower, they've been able to master and develop the new technology slower, less effectively, less efficiently, and they've paid a, a huge penalty um, for uh, being behind. Now, for what it's worth, that is not a, a new phenomenon, something characteristic of the, uh, you know, uh, 20 aughts, 2010s, 2020s. Um, we went through a similar uh, confluence of nonlinear abrupt discontinuous, uh, both strategic competitive and uh, technological change in the 70s and 80s. 
And so there the focus was less digital and more automotive and manufacturing, but it was equally abrupt and disruptive for so many people, right? So um, coming out of World War II, the US, which had been the, uh, the arsenal of democracy and all of that, uh, enjoyed the 50s and the 60s really unmolested in terms of competitive uh, threats from abroad. And then we get into the 70s and 80s, and there's this is emergence of uh, really wildly competitive Japanese and German and other European um, organizations. And this is coinciding with uh, the early digital transformations, the um, democratization of computing power from um, you know, mainframes to uh, uh, mini computers and microcomputers and workstations and desktop computers and computers on board, all sorts of uh, instrumentation, whether it's uh, CNC machining or the uh, electronics that started to build up into products like automobiles and that sort of thing. And what we saw in that period also, um, like we're seeing now, is this uh, real cleavage between those who managed in these, uh, this period of um, discontinuous strategic and competitive change and technological change, and those who really floundered. And um, when we go back and take a look uh, at the auto industry, wouldn't you know, it's a similar pattern that um, everything else was equal, right? Access to markets, access to customers, access to uh, existing off-the-shelf technology. And the only difference was really in performance. And the only explanatory variable left was that somehow the leaders in the 70s and 80s, like in the 2000s, um, they had somehow figured out how to um, understand better the new competitive environment, understand better what they needed to deliver, understand better, invent how to deliver uh, solutions to the new problems that were emerging in these marketplaces. And in doing so, in doing so, um, yield really crazy outsized, outside rewards um, for getting smarter, much smarter, much faster, much better, much easier than anybody else. And so um, without chewing your ear off, um, there are a host of other examples of organizations which have been so able to um, basically outlearn their competition, whether it's like Toyota already mentioned. Um, there's a, a chapter in my book where I devoted to uh, a case study about the U.S. experience with um, atomic power onboard warships versus that of the Soviets. Alcoa, we've got another case study in the book about that. Um, Pratt & Whitney, masterful transformation about how it um, designed jet engines, on and on. So lots and lots of examples around this, which really just support the idea that some organizations, when they figure out how to harness the intellectual horsepower of the enterprise as a whole, um, doing so effectively leads to much greater, much more rewarding outcomes for everybody, and, and not just some select group, but really all stakeholders. And so what I want to do is use um, this uh, time to uh, highlight at least three um, approaches that successful organizations have used to tap really well into that intellectual horsepower, uh, integrate the efforts of many, many individuals towards common purpose and deliver, well, generate and then deliver enormous value into the marketplace far beyond what any of their rivals, competitors um, could even imagine doing, let alone actually accomplish. So the first, the first um, issue I wanna talk about is the idea of creating protected space, protected space, for people to invent new things. And the basic rationale um, about creating protected space is that when the environment in which we're operating is changing, the norms, the values, the metrics, those also have to change. Um, whatever we've been doing, even if we continue to be successful at it, um, those norms, those metrics, uh, those values are good for the legacy situation, but they may not be good for the uh, new situation. There's that. And then, of course, the, um, the skills, the capabilities, the routines, the habits, et cetera, et cetera, that we've uh, been using to uh, develop new things, develop new routines, develop new methods. Um, those mechanisms may be beautifully well-tuned for what has been the legacy environment, but they may not well be tuned uh, or they may not be tuned well for the new environment. We have to create some protected space uh, where um, a cross-functional team with people who are 
worried about the competitive space, people who are worried about the technological space, people who are worried about these supporting organizational processes, they can get together and figure out new operational models to be successful in a new operating environment. And there, there are a host of examples of that. So for example, you know, story you know, for uh, decades is um, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. And the idea was that Lockheed Martin would uh, allow a select group of scientists, engineers, and so on to go off and create. Now, here's the thing is that with each of the creations, each of the products that came out of Skunk Works, there was this necessity to allow this creative space unencumbered by and non unencumbered by and non disruptive of the existing, the legacy, the established mechanisms and routines and enterprise processes. Because again, it was a matter of figuring out some new approach to accomplishing some new mission. And each of the aircraft that uh, came out of the Skunk Works, again, I think is critically important. It's not just a new technology. It's a new technology with a new mission that had to be discovered. And it was through the rich conversation between those who worried about the mission, those who worried about the technology, those who worried about the supporting process, it was through that rich confluence of conversation that solutions were able to come out of Skunk Works. It was necessary to have Skunk Works in order to have those conversations. Second example, um, which is uh, closely uh, related to this idea of creating protected space for this uh, conversation, this cooperative cross-functional conversation about those who worry about the competitive space, those who worry about the technological space, and those who worry about the organizational supporting processes. That, that's uh, illustrated by the experience um, General Motors and Toyota had in trying to invent a 21st century car for the purposes of um, appealing to consumers' concerns about the environment, fuel efficiency, cost, et cetera, et cetera. So um, both General Motors and Toyota recognized that the competitive environment was changing, that more and more um, municipalities and individual consumers were worried about smog emissions, costs, et cetera, et cetera. And both General Motors and Toyota realized that in order to meet those needs, they had to come up with a technological solution of doubling fuel efficiency. So General Motors had this idea that if it could put an electric motor on a car with a battery power behind it, um, and that was a, expressed as the Chevy Volt, that might get them in the direction of competing in this new contested space. Um, they came up with the Chevy Volt, and the Chevy Volt was a relatively simple architecture, relatively simple car, not an overly impressive technology, and General Motors sold some you know, 160,000 units of it before discontinuing uh, the Volt, and then sort of rolling over to the Bolt, you know, pure electric. Toyota, on the other hand, um, was able to develop the hybrid drive system and um, has over the years put that on some several dozen models uh, and has sold, again, in the same period that Chevy was able to get 160,000 units out the door, Toyota has gotten close to 20 million units out the door. Again, I just want to emphasize, that's a ratio of 100 to 1. And you say, well, how, how, how could you get a difference of 100 to 1 outcome? When two organizations with, you know, both phenomenal histories of great success in that industry, how can you get differences um, in outcome 100 to 1 when all else is equal? Well, it turns out when we look at what uh, Chevy did, they asked the engineers there to design a car which more or less was being designed through the legacy, the established um, processes by which conventional cars were designed. And not surprisingly, the, um, the Chevy Volt came out presented as more or less interchangeable with the Malibu and other mid-size, mid-market cars, um, configured, architected more or less like other mid-size, mid-market cars. Problem was, as far as a mid-size, mid-market car, it wasn't nearly as good as just a basic standard internal combustion engine, 160,000 um, novelty units sold. On the other hand, Toyota said, well, you know, we really don't understand the market space where people will reward us for much, much better fuel efficiency. 
And we certainly don't understand the technology. And so Toyota created a protective space for engineers and people expert in market and all of that to um, discover their way to the right answer. Um, and uh, the team was uh, deposited in something called the Red Room. And it was just by the coincidence that the room they were given where they could go off and do their thing of discovery, happen to have red carpet. So that's why it was called the red room. But because these people were in this protected space, um, not nearly as glamorous as sounding, you know, the red room versus skunk works, but uh, nevertheless, a protected space, protected from the norms, the values, the metrics of the dominant organization, and also protected from having to subscribe to established routines of collaboration and creativity, that team was able to form partnerships with Mitsubishi Electric about special types of power management switches, create partnerships with others who were expert in uh, sophisticated power management software, because the uh, number of millions and tens of millions of lines of code on a, on a Prius or a hybrid driver just, you know, way beyond anything that had ever been done in that industry before. They were able to partner with people expert in um, industrial manufacturing equipment to um, create the mass producible electric motors that eventually went into the car. Anyway, that allowance of protected space to invent the business model, invent the competitive model, invent the technology and make sure that when all that invention was going on, it was done in concert, it depended on having this protected space, the red room. Um, another example of where protected space proved just phenomenally valuable. So in terms of another confluence of changing strategic environment and changing technological environment, um, the period between World War I and World War II, the changing strategic environment was uh, military rivalry, political rivalry between Japan on one side of the Pacific and the United States on the other side of the Pacific. The um, change in technological environment, of course, was the introduction of uh, naval aviation as uh, you know, really nonlinear, um, discontinuous, abrupt change from um, you know, a long tradition of uh, man of war and dreadnoughts and battleships, you know, gunned, gunned um, warships. Now, it turns out the US Navy, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, but let's jump to the end and then go back to the beginning. So in um, June 1940, um, June 1942, this is six months after the Battle of Midway. I'm sorry, this is six months after uh, Pearl Harbor. The Japanese Navy had this idea of um, launching a strike, a uh, surprise attack on Midway Island, sort of halfway between Hawaii and Japan. And with the idea that after having already destroyed all of the US uh, battleship fleet it would lure the US aircraft carrier fleet out to a climactic battle um, at Midway Island and sort of be the coup de gras. Now, um, as all of you know, that's not exactly what happened, though there was a, a surprise attack and a um, pivotal battle at Midway. It was pivotal, pivotal uh, to the advantage of the United States Navy, not the Japanese Navy. And the Japanese Navy took um, so many losses of aircraft carrier and other ships that uh, while the rest of the Pacific War was horrible and bloody and terrible cost of uh, um, lives and national treasure, the Japanese Navy from that point on was ne never able to fight offensively. It was always a defensive, you know, again, a defensive bloody retreat um, back to the, uh, the home islands. And he asked the question, well, how was it that the United States Navy, um, having suffered such a devastating strike at Pearl Harbor only six months prior, and arriving in Midway um, in response to a surprise attack right there on the defensive with fewer aircraft and ships and sailors and all of that, how did the United States Navy um, uh, manage to win? And um, I point as reference to this book, Shattered Sword, by these two authors, uh, uh, Partial and Tully, and what they set up, and this is my words, not theirs, but to get to the point, that they said what really was the difference wasn't the technology itself, it was a culture of yes admiral versus yo admiral um, between the two navies. Now, the, the way they say it, uh, Partial and Tully, is that they say the Japanese uh, naval leadership um, that uh, 
they had taken lessons out of their conflict with the Russians in 1905, battleship on battleship um, near Russia, near Japan, and had re arrived at a concept of operations, a massive first strike, one fleet destroying the other fleet with the loss of the fleet, the, that fleet's nation losing the will to fight. And um, by 1929, they had really locked in, really locked in um, this concept of operations, which arguably was not that different than the concept of operations that the Japanese Navy had been using for the last 20 years, back to the 1900s when it first started asserting itself as a, a naval force. Um, and you start thinking about committing to a concept of operations in 1929, you know, in one way it might seem sort of counterintuitive, naval aviation was a new thing. But think about how liberating it was to um, keep with what was already tried and true, maybe like General Motors with the Chevy Volt, right? Which is once you commit to a decision about your concept of operations, then you can make decisions about design of ships, design of aircraft, design of tactics, training, how you're gonna refuel, how you're gonna rearm, how you're gonna resupply, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden, making that decision allows everybody else to start doing all the manning, all the equipping that gets you ready for what might be the, con you know, the conflict for which you're preparing. Now, on the other hand, the United States Navy um, did no such thing about jumping to what turned out to be a premature uh, set of decisions. So um, this is a timeline of something that the United States Navy was doing. Um, every year, from the early 1920s until the, the onset of the Second World War, the United States Navy was running things called fleet problems. Now, what were fleet problems? Is that, now remember what's going on, of course, right? That the United States Navy is um, coming out of World War I and it's asserting itself as a new um, international um, global power, an international uh, global naval power. And it's building battleships and cruisers and uh, destroyers, just like everybody else in the world. So it's got its legacy processes going on in terms of manning, training, equipping, acquisition, deployment, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a realization that this naval aviation thing may not fit, may not fit into these uh, legacy processes based on these legacy concepts of operation. And so each year, the Navy created this protective time, this protected space to send ships and sailors out to sea to run not exercises in terms of rehearsal of already established concepts, but to run problems or what were called fleet problems to just go try to do new things that and try to invent solutions to problems which did not have uh, yet resolution. So for example, as the United States Navy started thinking of um, competing across um, the Pacific, it realized it might have to move uh, ships and crews from the Atlantic to the Pacific or the Pacific back to the Atlantic. And it came up with, we have to figure out how to defend the Panama Canal. And one of the things I want to highlight on this list is that um, the Panama Canal problem was the first one run in 1923. Um, apparently it wasn't run with enough satisfaction that it was rerun, again, you know, building lessons built on lessons, again in 1927, it was rerun again in 1929. Now, why do I highlight that? Um, one, to point out that um, the US Navy's leadership didn't think that they had a resolution. They went back two and three times. It's starting to feel like a little bit like agile is done today. You know, take a shot, MVP, get feedback on another. And so, right, so they did MVP on defending the Panama Canal. But the other thing is just 1929, right? Because 1929, the United States is on its third iteration defending the Panama Canal. The Japanese Navy has already decided its concept of operations. Now, 1929, the US has still not arrived at its concept of operations. It hasn't yet settled on because it hasn't figured out how to uh, do amphibious landings, it hasn't yet figured out how to support um, ground forces on a, island um, positions. It hasn't yet figured out uh, how to defend or launch a surprise attack. Hasn't yet had to figure out how to do a search and evasion and those sorts of things. Hasn't yet figured out how to um, do uh, at sea resupply. So um, while the Japanese Navy may feel satisfied that they've got all of the 30s to um, uh, man and equip, the United States Navy is still going through in these protected spaces of these fleet problems protected from 
the normal stuff going on with battleships and cruisers and destroyers going through um, this invention of a new concept of operations um, and the invention of new technology, which are mutually supportive. Now, so what ends up happening at um, Midway is that the Japanese Navy showed up with uh, new ships and planes and sailors trained to that, but to an old concept of operations on this massive first strike. Well, it turns out maybe that might have worked again had it been battleship on battleship. But when you have aircraft carriers operating at such um, elongated distances, one from the other, that whole first strike thing, it depends, of course, on a key assumption that you find your opponent quickly. What had happened during this period of protected space for these fleet problems, the United States Navy came upon this idea of pulsed attack. They did that, you send out waves, and the waves may succeed and may not succeed, but they come back and they refuel, they rearm based on the lessons learned from one wave onto the other wave, onto the other wave, onto the other wave. And so um, the, the Japanese Navy just found themselves grotesquely outclassed. And again, not because the US Navy showed up with sort of in some kind of crude way, better technology, not, certainly not because it showed up with more material and more men, it showed up smarter. Why did it show up smarter? because it created this protected space for itself over a 20 year period, whereas the Japanese Navy had already locked in to uh, equipping itself with new technology, but to a legacy and increasingly outdated concept of operations. And so um, as we start thinking through managing our ways through this periods of um, abrupt change, lesson one is we really ought to be thinking about how we create protected space to have that creative interaction between those who are leaning into the problem space and those who are leading into the technology space and those who are leading into the operational space and have those protected conversations to come up with new and better ways to succeed. All right, now on to lesson two. And this, what I call is a sort of center out versus top down leadership. And just real quick, what I wanna say about this is, um, you know, situation where you've got yourself with um, distributed operations. Now, one way to think about distributed operations is just, ah, it's like a portfolio project, just diversified my risk. I've got, you know, five or 10 or 15 different locations, let them do their own thing. And, um, you know, just sort of, you know, average out the probabilities of success and failure. That's one approach. Another approach is that I've got, you know, my five, 10, 15 distributed operations. So what I'm gonna do is at the center is the leader at headquarters, you know, I'm gonna grab the reins of control. I'm gonna um, accrue to myself uh, data decision rights, instruction rights, et cetera, et cetera. And run basically uh, a center out command control compliance audit kind of uh, mechanism. Uh, a third approach, and this is obviously a saving of flies is the one I'm going to champion, is an approach instead where the center is not there um, assuming onto itself uh, data decision rights and an assumed expertise, but rather it's a facilitator, a facilitator of pushing out to the edges, the operational edges, the best understanding uh, that already exists. But again, I want to make clear, not the best possible understanding, but the best understanding now, push out to the operating edges, the opportunity to conduct experiments informed by um, local idiosyncrasies with the advantage of the fast, the frequent, the nuanced nature of what's going on on the edge. And then having that come back towards the center where it can be synthesized into an ever, ever evolving uh, better and better and better. Now, this idea of um, top down versus center out, we can actually see a lot of um, contemporary successes and failures, which fit exactly into these patterns of uh, top down failing and center out succeeding. So, you know, pick something which is on everyone's mind is uh, our experience making it through the COVID pandemic. Now, one of the things that um, we struggled on early on in the United States was testing. It was just, and you start thinking about the huge costs of not having a reliable, deployable, wild, you know, widely deployable test available. Um, shutdowns had to last longer to pre prevent, um, I'm sorry, shutdowns had to last longer to prevent cross-contamination, transmission, et cetera, et cetera, to the extent that, um, cross-contamination and infection and spread wasn't 
um, prevented because it wasn't clear who was and who wasn't infected, who was symptomatic, who was asymptomatic, but infected. The human cost just had to be staggering. I, I, don't, I don't know, I've seen an estimate on that, but when you consider the number of ill and the number of uh, deceased, the, the cost of not knowing who to isolate temporarily meant that we had to isolate everybody, but of course everyone was exposed and at risk. Um, so that was one example. And then on the other example, we have this just phenomenal speed with which we got multiple safe, effective vaccines into, the, into uh, practical use. So you say, well, how could it be so slow on the, um, the test and so quick on the vaccine? Well, it turns out that in the United States, two distinct agencies were responsible, one for the test, one for the vaccine. So the Centers for Disease Control um, was responsible for the test. They took a very top-down approach. They said, hold on, we're the Centers for Disease Control, we're sort of the experts on this sort of thing. Um, we're not going to go take off the shelf tests from other country. We're not going to let private entities create. We're going to create the standard test for the nation. Well, it turned out the standard test for the nation was uh, slow to develop. It was expensive to develop. It wasn't so um, high functioning when it finally was developed. So you had this long, long extended period where the, um, the U.S. Um, population didn't have the confidence, it didn't have the protection, it didn't have the assurances and the certainty of action that an effective widely distributed test would have allowed. And why is that? Because the CDC um, didn't tap into the very broad intellectual horsepower through the public sector, through the private sector, through the international space, just themselves. Now in contrast, in contrast, the um, the Food and Drug Administration, which was, which was responsible for the, um, the vaccine, they said, vaccines, yeah, we know a lot about vaccines, but we don't know a lot about the COVID-19 vaccine. And so they said, well, we're gonna create a situation where um, what we know about vaccines, what we know about COVID, what we know about SARS infections, we're gonna push out to the pharmaceutical companies. Um, uh, what we know about this mRNA technology, we're going to push out to the pharmaceutical companies. And then what we're going to do through a combination of financial incentives and risk shifting and that sort of thing, we're going to let them experiment. Again, this is around the operational edge. We're going to let them experiment and come up with the best answers they possibly can with the idea that the more people we have taking shots on goal, the more goals we'll get. And the more not only individual learning and individual success will we get, but as those successes start to pop up and they start sharing it back, we'll have the ability for cross-fertilization too. So um, when we look at uh, the delays in getting effective tests out and the speed with which we got you know, beautiful vaccines um, into vials, into syringes, into arms, um, into the population, you know, top down, it was terrible. Center out, it was wildly effective. Um, another example on this is uh, in the United States, um, we had great, great struggle getting public schools reopened. And just to put it in some um, calibration on this is we've got some 51 million students in uh, public school and uh, well known is the consequence of kids not going to school. I mean, yeah, there's the reading, the writing, the arithmetic they don't get. But for a lot of kids, public school is the place where they get their hot meal of the day. Public school is where they may get their medical care. Public school is where they may have um, that concerned adult who looks and always says, ooh, how'd you get that bruise? Ooh, you know, how'd you get that injury, right? Public schools perform a set of social services way above and beyond just the, uh, the pure sort of educational mission. And so kids who don't go to public school, the, the, the cost, again, is just uh, devastating. And in fact, um, well, anyway, I'll get to that in a moment. So anyway, when we look at what happened with uh, public school reopening or the public school experience with the, after COVID. So, you know, last year, January, all the kids are back in school. Last February, 2020, kids are back in school. Come March 1st, every kid's back in school. Come March 20th, no one's in school, right? Because at that point, boo, we got this COVID thing going on and spraying, you know, rocketing, roaring, ripping through the United States, and schools shut down. You know, some schools went online well, some schools, but anyway, they shut down in person. So now think about this. Six months later, right, we go from um, March 2020 to September, six months. That's sort of the same you know, period uh, span from uh, Pearl Harbor to Midway. 
we get to uh, September and some minuscule number of kids get into school. And even in January, all right, now, what you have, now you're up to nine months, not only your nine months, but you already have the example of the schools which have opened up. We only have a third of our kids back in school. And it's not till April where we get to about half of kids back in public school. And you start thinking about you know, back in, in, in public school in April, to clean out the desk you didn't use because school ends in May and June, right? But again, now think about this. You know, we talked about, um, you know, the consequences of not being in school for kids. A million kids disappeared from the system. I mean, just disappeared. It's not like, it's not like oh, you know, uh, Johnny or Lucy or one didn't show up. They lost track of those kids. Don't know where they are. All right, now you ask the question, what about the kids who are able to come back and have in-person um, safe education. Well, when we take a look at the, uh, the failure and the success on the failure side, New York, Boston area where I live, what we had is boards of education and sometimes even mayors and certainly mayors plus superintendents saying to everyone, oh no, you can't open. You can't open. You can't open until we give you an answer. Protocols, methods, et cetera, et cetera, on how to open. Well, here's the problem. There's so much new information pouring in all the time. There's so many problems to be resolved. I mean, you could just imagine sort of like the, 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 the mental CPU of the center shutting down, unable to process what's going on because there's so much information coming in, so many decisions that have to be made. Um, the bandwidth, it, it's just inadequate. And so what you see basically is just um, the center's freezing in so many major American cities because again, the center has uh, grabbed for itself data and decision rights. Um, and what do you have on the edge? People basically just twiddling their thumbs. Kids not going to school, the virtual not working very well. Parents, you know, you know, really at a loss of how to do homeschooling and this and that. Now in the few cases, you know, again, you know, that's some 20% in that uh, third um, September and then uh, by January, what's going on there? Completely different attitude. Folks in the center saying, we don't have an answer to this. You know, we've never had to educate during a pandemic. And, um, you know, we've got some information, maybe better information than uh, is available to individual teachers about, um, you know, uh, masking and social distancing and ventilation and hygiene, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and maybe we have some insights about the psychology that this will have on adults and on children, but, you know, we, we got best guesses. So what they did at the center is they said, you know, we'll take our best guesses, we'll push it out. Then what we're going to do, we're going to give permission to the folks on the operational edge, principals, teachers, to start running experiments. And so, um, and if you want more uh, more detail, because, you know, got a lot of cover here, check out, we did a webinar on this particular topic at uh, c2solve.com slash resources. And um, schools shut down in this one district in Wisconsin, um, let's say the 15th of March. By the 18th of March, they're already doing exercises on how to open and how to run safely. And um, to the point of the slide at the bottom, they've got uh, parents and students running experiments and giving feedback. They've got teachers trying new approaches um, in the spring and through the summer, trying new approaches, um, sharing with each other, whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer around the operational edge or back to the center with the center, center constantly, excuse me, synthesizing and sharing back out, um, constantly experimenting, constantly experimenting on uh, what to do and how to do it better and better and better. So um, we've got that. And again, with just, you know, wildly different outcomes. Now, in terms of um, where we are, we said, look, you know, in periods of abrupt change, you really have to figure out how to do uh, different things. And there are a couple of strategies. One is create the protected space. Second is uh, in that protected space, if you've got a problem, don't have some quote unquote elite grab responsibility for that problem get it out so you get the variation, selection, retention, synthesis, sharing, cross-fertilization on the edge. And the time remaining, I just want to emphasize one more point, which is this idea when you have um, work that has to be done, invention that has to be done, pulling in across many, many different disciplines, 
Um, be cautious that you don't isolate people in silos, that you actually worry about building the horizontal flow of invention, the horizontal flow of flow, the horizontal flow of invention, the horizontal flow of collaboration, the horizontal flow of creative conversation so that um, people aren't isolated. And to illustrate that one, um, I'll get you, take you through a, a case very quickly. And again, just to, uh, if you're interested in seeing that case developed more uh, soundly, again, if you check out, we've got some webinars at uh, c2solve.com resources. We've got a, um, a case study where, where we go, same case, but we're gonna go into it in more than the few minutes I have left now with you. But the, uh, the, the issue was in um, the problem of um, developing new medications. And that's a wildly complex, multi-silo uh, problem. Um, developing a new medication may take a decade, may cost a billion dollars or more. Um, I mean, it's a massive undertaking to develop uh, a new medication. And so uh, some colleagues and I, we took a look at a phase in uh, drug discovery, um, a phase in drug discovery called hit to lead. And what hit to lead is, is um, Early on, uh, biologists do what's called high throughput screening, and they try to figure out some sort of indicators of molecules which may or may not attach onto proteins inside a cell, get that uh, protein to behave differently to deal with the disease. And they pass those um, leading indicators, as it were, coming out of this high throughput screening over to chemists whose job is to develop um, real molecules that actually adhere well in the right way to the protein to cause it to behave that are worth further investigation as drug candidates. Now, um, when uh, the scientists involved with this work, primarily chemists at first, try to figure out how long it would take uh, to get a molecule from hit to lead uh, so it could be passed on as a drug candidate, um, they figured out, you know, 51 days, 51 days. When they looked at their actual um, cycle times, it wasn't 51 days, it was uh, sometimes uh, double, if not quadruple that. And when they started asking the question, what the, what, what the heck, why does it take so darn long to go from a hit to lead, not 50 days, but 100 or 200 days? They started looking at what the workflow was as a spouse versus actual. So what they thought was, you know, you do a step, the work goes to the next step, to the next step, you know, from A to B to C, to, you know, all the way on until it's done. What they found was that uh, someone would do work and sit around and then finally get picked up again and sit around and get picked up again and sit around and get picked up again. Now, here's the thing. This, this, this is a sign of a, um, a solid organization. Everyone everyone was working hard. It wasn't like people were slacking off and that's why stuff was sitting down, you know, I'm working hard, working hard. Oh, and then I put it down and then I pick it up and then I put it down. Nothing like that. I'm working hard on one thing. I'm working hard on another. The thing is it gets put and no one else picks it up and then it sits around until someone picks it up later. And so it is, why is it, why is it that we know we have such urgency to get medication to the people who need it so they can feel better, do more, live longer? Why is stuff sitting around? And um, what they found was that they had created organizations, you know, biology here, chemistry here, da 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 da, that um, not only were the silos isolated from each other, but even within silos, people were isolated from each other. And individual chemists, individual scientists were working on what seemed pressing, what seemed interesting, what seemed uh, important, but necessarily what was uh, the priorities. And so, step one, Step one in um, solving this problem, the, uh, the chemist who was leading this uh, fantastic scientist, a fantastic chemist named Beth, she started having uh, meetings with um, her fellow chemists. And again, this wasn't Beth sort of taking on, you know, sort of an alpha personality kind of thing. She said, Let, let's work through priorities in terms of what molecules we want to get through and what questions do we have to resolve in order to... Um, get those molecules through. And what Beth was doing was giving the individuals a sense of the larger system. Now, again, it was just the larger chemistry system of which they were part. But um, by doing that um, and just having the conversation about priorities, people then can have not only a prioritization you know, one, two, and three, but if someone argued for one versus two versus three or A versus B versus C, there's already knowledge sharing going on. 
And people say, oh, I'm working on this. Oh, you know, that's an insight that you could use. Oh, I'm working on this. That's an insight that I could use over here. Now, um, what started to happen is people ha started having these conversations across um, individual bench tops, as it were. They started looking at the data that things they were sending out to uh, adjacent laboratories in biology. So chemists make a molecule, the biologists not only test it, but invent the tests for it. And they started realizing that um, when they were having these conversations in chemistry, they were depending on information from biology and they didn't always necessarily understand what the information went, meant. So they started inviting the biologists into the conversations. And um, by having this greater synchronization of prioritization, having this greater synchronization of um, timing, now you started having a much, much richer flow of information within chemistry, within chemistry, within biology, biology to chemistry. And so now you started getting the situation where it wasn't things would sit in a stovepipe within a stovepipe and occasionally pop out and then sit in another stovepipe within a stovepipe and occasionally pop out. It was an idea would go into chemistry and then back to biology and come back roaring through chemistry and on and on. And as this process was going on and people realizing we can have these wildly creative collaborative conversations within chemistry. And then we can have these widely collaborative creative conversations across chemistry to biology. They realize, wait a second, there's all these folks who do purification. We're not even talking. Let's expand to there. There's people in, um, who manage our relationship with suppliers. Let's expand to there. And we start thinking sort of geometrically and I did it sort of imperfectly here. The, um, the traditional model is everyone was isolated vertically. This type of chemist isolated from this type of chemist, from this type of biologist. And now what that is, this linkage of flow of ideas through the system, boom, 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 boom. Now, what was the net result of all this is that um, when this uh, effort started, it took some 13 months to get product uh, um, through this hit to lead pipeline hit to lead pipeline. Cause those the reference I made before 51 days, hundred days, that was cycles. And it was many, many cycles, 60 cycles to go um, through hit to lead. And by changing and expanding these conversations, they got from 13 months down to six and from 60 of those cycles, you know, each of them was taking hundred, 200 days down to only 19. It was phenomenal, phenomenal difference in outcome. Um, again, people working, hard but not as stressed but in concert with each other not in isolation so ideas and inventions right through the system so anyway uh just to finish up here and i apologize for just a little bit long um first of all a little bit of comfort that even though we're in a period of uh abrupt change both in terms of the competitive space and the technological space not only shouldn't we worry, we should recognize this as um, an opportunity because the apple carts are being upset. In order though, to um, take advantage of uh, these uh, discontinuous, abrupt, nonlinear changes, we gotta be um, really deliberate and thoughtful about, we, about how we harness the intellectual horsepower of the enterprise. And the way to do that in part at least is to make sure we have protected space to explore the new contested space. And in that protected space, we have that cross-functional um, group of people who think about how to compete, think about how to use the technology, think about the operational support necessary. We got all that together. That when we have really hard problems, we ask ourselves, is the center hogging for itself the rights and the privileges to um, deal with that? Or is the center pushing out to the operational edge the opportunity to experiment so that we have all this collective experience from which we can synthesize really good answers. Think about those schools who opened versus closed, the um, COVID vaccine versus the COVID test. And lastly, um, when we start thinking about the flow of ideas through the system, have we really created the track? Have we really created the pathway for um, ideas to flow start to finish because we've got very effective, synchronized, collaborative conversation going on, or just take a look around. Is it lots of people working in isolation, but things not moving forward because they're locked into these isolating silos? So anyway, that's my story. 
um, we're in a really unusual period. Um, that creates lots of challenge. It creates lots and lots of opportunity to be exploited if we take full advantage of the great intelligence, the great wisdom, the creativity, the inventiveness, the innovativeness of what's spread throughout our enterprises. Again, thank you for your time. Good luck. And I look to forward to continuing this conversation, um, not in a recorded fashion. Thank you.